we're starting to see some new plantings now and some of the replacement trees are starting to look pretty good. Nice. All right, I'm seeing at least five uh, mostly happy faces of planning committee members. So I'll, I'll call our 51st planning committee meeting of the term to order. Um, we acknowledge that Ottawa is located on unceded territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe Nation, whose culture and presence have nurtured and continued to nurture this land. Il est important de souligner que la ville d'Ottawa se trouve sur un territoire non cédé de la nation algonquine Anishinaabe, dont la culture et la présence ont enrichi et continuent d'enrichir ces terres. Uh, Committee Coordinator Eric Pelot, can you do a roll call, please? Councillor Dudas. I'm here. Councillor Tierney. Present. Councillor Lieber. Here. Councillor Brockington. Here. Councillor Menard. Here. Uh, Councillor Clutzi. Present. Uh, Councillor Kitts. Here. Councillor Hubley. Here. Co-chair Moffitt. Uh, Co-chair Gower. Present. You have quorum chair. Thank you, Eric. This is a public meeting to receive oral submissions pursuant to the Development Charges Act listed as item one on today's agenda. This is also a public meeting to consider the proposed zoning bylaw amendments listed as items two and three on today's agenda. For items two and three, only those who make oral submissions today or written submissions before the amendments are adopted may appeal the matter to the Ontario Land Tribunal. In addition, the applicant may appeal the matter to the Ontario Land Tribunal if council does not adopt an amendment within 90 days of receipt of the application for a zoning bylaw amendment. To submit written comments on these amendments prior to their consideration by City Council on November 10th, 2021, please email or call the committee or council coordinator. So interesting fact of appeals, you do not need to make a oral or written submission to appeal a DC bylaw. Are there any uh, declarations of interest this morning? I'm seeing none. We're going to do confirmation of minutes. We have uh, uh, four different meetings we need to approve minutes for. First is the last regular meeting of planning committee from September 23rd, 2021. Are the minutes confirmed? Confirmed. Carried. You? Uh, minutes for the special joint meeting of planning committee and community and protective services committee for September 27th, 2021. That was the parks and recreation master plan. Are the minutes confirmed? Confirmed. Thank you. And the minutes for the special joint committee of planning committee and built heritage subcommittee that was related to the Ottawa hospital master plan, October 1st, 2021. Are the minutes confirmed? Great. Thank you. And the minutes for the special meeting of planning committee. This was for the uh, Ottawa hospital again, October 1st and October 4th, 2021. Are the minutes confirmed? Confirmed. 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 Thank you. And uh, we will be looking at the minutes for the official plan joint meeting at the next meeting of planning committee. So we don't have to confirm that today. We have three items on the agenda for this morning. Um, I'll just go through each one and see if we need to hold them for further discussion. Uh, the first is the new zoning bylaw proposed budget and revised work plan for 2020. I have a few questions on that, please. Should we hold that, uh, Councillor Leeper, or are they quick questions? or um, Let's hold it, please. We will hold that, no problem. Um, the second item is a zoning bylaw amendment for 2865 Riverside Drive in River, River Ward. We have a, a delegation, so we'll hold that one. And the third item is a zoning bylaw amendment for 129 and 133 Catherine Street in Somerset Ward. We don't have any speakers, but I understand uh, Councillor McKenney would like to introduce a motion that will be moved by Councillor Leeper on their behalf. Councillor McKenney. 
Yes, thanks. Uh, thanks, Chair. Did you want me to introduce that now? Yeah, if you can, let's uh, put it out there. And if we can deal with it now, we will rather than hold it. Okay, that'd be great. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, this is uh, on the uh, the zone, zoning bylaw amendment report 129 133 Catherine Street. Uh, where's the owner of 129 and 133 Catherine? All, also owns 352 Somerset, uh, also known as Somerset House, at the southeast corner of Somerset and Bank, an individually designated building under Part 4 of the Ontario Heritage Act. Whereas uh, the eastern portion of 352 Somerset partially, partially collapsed in October 2007, and whereas council permitted the subsequent demolition of the eastern portion of the building in 2016 as it posed a danger to the public, whereas the building has been in a state of disrepair since, whereas in May 2017, council approved a rehabilitation plan for the building and the issuance of a heritage permit with a two-year expiry, which the property owner allowed to expire without undertaking any significant work on the building. Whereas no significant improvements to the property have been made by the property owner since the partial demolition of the building. Whereas the property owner has presented numerous proposals for 352 Somerset over the years extensively meeting with planning and heritage staff and failed to make any positive progress shows that he has no intention to redevelop the site. Whereas this property owner also owns a surface parking lot at 154 O'Connor in contravention of the zoning bylaw for which temporary three-year permission lapsed in 2018 and a reapplication has not been sought. Whereas a Commercial parking lot has been established at 138 Gloucester, just west of 154 O'Connor site, also in contravention of the zoning bylaw. Whereas the given history, given the history of neglect, apathy, and disregard for city bylaws and policies, there is no way of knowing this property owner will follow through and build at the Catherine site. Therefore, be it resolved that planning committee to further report zoning bylaw amendment 129 and 133 Catherine Street until there is proof this property owner can be a responsible downtown property owner and commit to deliverable plans to rehabilitate the Somerset House site and be it further resolved that there be no further notice pursuant to subsection 3417 of the Planning Act. So that the motion is pretty uh, self-explanatory, but uh, you know Somerset House has been uh, an issue for the city of Ottawa. It's been an embarrassment for the city of Ottawa uh, for many years, um, and uh, we have seen um, the owner in front of us or his delegate in front of us many times. Uh, we don't have um, the tools that we need, the leverage that we need to redevelop this property. There's, I wanna also point out that there is, um, he was uh, given a, a notice of violation uh, back in 2017 uh, to fix up at least the heritage elements of the building that dragged through court, um, you know, for years through COVID. Uh, and when we finally got in front of a judge, uh, he was able to convince the judge for yet another extension. So this is a part four heritage building that is falling into, um, it's being demolished through, through neglect. Um, and uh, we really don't have much leverage, um, you know, outside of a possible expropriation, uh, which, you know, is um, exceptionally difficult to follow through on. We don't have much leverage to uh, compel this owner to uh, fix up this building, which is in um, a prominent downtown corner at the corner of Bank and, uh, and Somerset. So I would uh, ask my colleagues if there are any questions and uh, I seek your support on, um, on uh, deferring this subsequent application. So there are some questions. So we'll hold this item and we'll come back to it uh, as third on the agenda. Thanks, Councillor. Thank you. 
Okay, so let's, well, we held all the items. Let's go back to our held items. The first item was the uh, new zoning bylaw for the proposed budget and revised uh, work plan for 2022-2024. Um, we do have staff here who could give us a quick overview, but I, I think uh, most councillors have had a chance to read the report. So I think it'd be best just to jump right into questions. Uh, Councillor Leeper, you asked for the item to be held. Uh, would you like to go first with questions? Sure. Um, so obviously this is going to be a, a massive effort and I would suggest that it's going to be um, an even uh, more difficult exercise than the official plan was. Um, every neighborhood is going to want to have uh, touch with planning staff. Uh, every councillor is going to be asking city staff to come meet with the community associations. I've got nine of them in Kitchissippi or 10. Uh, next term, I'll have nine. Uh, and I'll be asking you to meet with, uh, with those as a group and, and maintain fairly frequent touch with them. Is this sufficient budget? And what I would ask is, uh, we're asking for an additional uh, six point two million or something like that for uh, for the for the exercise. How much did the official plan cost to do? Even ballpark figure. Yes, thank you, Chair. I can uh, I can answer that question. Um, the budget uh, the budget for the official plan was uh, in round numbers three point seven six million dollars, and it looks like we'll be spending probably all of we're on track to uh, to exhaust that budget. So that was the cost of the official plan. Will, uh, will the budget that is proposed give you the same resources as for the official plan or, or fewer? David, would you like to uh, respond to that? Yeah, the, uh, the budget that we're looking at here is a, is a couple of things. We've got uh, a team of five planners that I will be looking to retain who will be focusing on residential zones. Uh, I'll be looking to retain four additional planners to help us out with non-residential zones. So that's the mixed use commercial centers, TDs, industrial zones, environmental zones, things like that. I'll also be looking for four additional planners, the support staff um, to, uh, to deal with exceptions, schedules, overlays, uh, legal non-conforming issues, all of the other uh, issues that need to come up, projections, uh, administration sections, all of those things. Uh, as well, we also have uh, a fairly significant GIS exercise as well that we're going to be doing. It's unfortunate that I actually had a beautiful presentation with just fantastic visuals uh, for you. Send it to um, me, to sort please. Of showcase what it is. I'll send you some of those photos uh, that, that are pretty cool. But we also have a, a big part of this as well, as well is really bringing a mapping framework into the 21st century as well. So we also have um, a team of uh, GIS people who are working on that as well. So we, we really do have a, a, an all hands on deck uh, situation here. We know that we are, are going to need to send wave after wave planners uh, into the community associations to have those hard discussions. Uh, and to do those lengthy discussions that need to be done. And quite frankly, the time frame that we have is tight. It is aggressive. Three years may seem like a long time, but three years when you're talking about a zoning bylaw and when you're talking about dealing with property owners on a lot by lot basis will go by very quickly. So, but the question was, how does the, how does the effort compare to the OP effort? Is this a similar level of resources or a, a lower level of resources? No, I'll, I'll start with that, David, and you can add, certainly, it, it, I would sure. say it's almost double uh, the resources for the official plan. Uh, we had a, a nine temporary FTs on the uh, OP team, and I'm, I can't add up uh, the numbers, but David's resources are significantly more. Okay. Um and sorry, I, uh, as you were uh, chatting, David, I also realized uh, I should have mentioned the equity seeking groups as well, right? It's not just community associations. I think our community associations were relatively um, pleased, uh, certainly in Kitchissippi, at the the touch points. I think they probably would have liked more. Uh, and certainly the equity seeking groups, I think we're looking for a, a stronger role uh, and more contact with the planning team as well. Um, so, yeah, I'll, I'll vote for this. I guess the, the question I have is, if you need more resources beyond double what we put into the um, OP, what are our mechanisms for getting that? Because I, I don't want to run into a situation where we're running out of budget and, and planners have to stop going into uh, the various communities we serve. Yeah, I, I think, Councillor, if I could just answer that, one of the things that we're going to be doing is we are going through uh, and looking for the clean copy of the official plan, going through all of the various motions and changes that have occurred through planning committee, uh, ARAC, and also council, 
uh, to get a complete picture of what that policy package is going to look like. And we'll be coming back to Council with a detailed work plan uh, in uh, early next year uh, that will lay out exactly how we are going to do the zoning exercise in detail as we go through. Uh, if we find that we are going to have some issues with respect to phasing or uh, allocating priorities with respect to all of the various secondary plan asks that have also come out of that exercise, we will go through in detail uh, what we will need to do to respond to all of those challenges then. You will have another opportunity to look at this in detail and understand very clearly what it is that we are going to do and how we are going to do it. Do we have the opportunity to go into DCs if we need more resources or will it be tax supported? The uh, allocation that we're doing right now is a development charge amendment. Uh, so 90% of the, uh, the zoning budget will be supported by DC as part of this, uh, this package that, uh, that we present here today. Uh, if there is additional scope change uh, or unforeseen circumstances, then that's something that we would have to revisit at that time. I can't make predictions right now. Okay, I mean, we promised a lot of um, we promised a lot of communities uh, some special attention through secondary plans and uh, targeted looks. And I'm looking at the um, the budgets that have been allocated for things like community design plans, uh, community infrastructure plans. Uh, you know, three million dollars or so. And I'm I'm just not sure that we're going to be able to fulfill quite the level of commitment that we made through the OP process with that level of budget. But um, I, I will keep an open mind uh, that, that you've proposed the right amount of money. So uh, with that, I'll turn it over to uh, uh, back to the chair. Thanks, Councillor. Councillor Brockington. Thanks, Jaren. Good morning. I, I think if we just look at the actual budget that's proposed here and compare it to the OP, you could conclude that this is a lot more intensive. It is the comprehensive zoning bylaw. And um, when I look at the work plan, I see terms like consultation with the public, consultation with stakeholders, but I'm not, a, that doesn't um, give me detail and maybe this is a high level work plan and we're not getting into the weeds as, as far as to how this will be done, but there's very high expectations in my ward that the consultation on the zoning bylaw, how we're going to do this, is going to be significantly more intensive than the OP. The OP was the, the global planning policy. Five big move white papers. Now it's going to impact people street by street. And the expectations are very high. It's not come to one of our meetings and have a feedback session. As Mr. Wise knows, I have presidents who want to know street by street how they're going to be impacted. And so how do we match expectations which, with the ability to deliver over the next three years? Because people who are apprehensive just about the global OP and how their neighborhoods are going to change are going to want that detail. They're going to want that opportunity for planning staff to come into the neighborhood and have that not one discussion. This is going to have to be multiple discussions. And so is that factored in? Do you have enough staff? Do you have the communication staff that we need? Do we have the human resources to go across the city to have those meetings? And so you're going to have to reach out to every member of council to talk about expectations, talk about how we're going to do that. I don't think community by community is realistic, but definitely wardwide, the ward council can help shepherd those meetings. But that's my number one concern going forward is people really need to understand how this is how the zoning bylaw is going to impact them and they need input to that process so i would i'm curious uh, for your comments on that please mr chairs so i think that uh there is no doubt whatsoever that staff fully understand and recognize the significance complexity and scale of what it is that we are about to undertake um, Councillor Brockington, as you know, uh, certainly I'm, I'm well aware of the level of detail uh, that uh, certain uh, community associations are looking for. Quite frankly, they deserve to know it. Uh, one of the things that we are talking about when we talk about zoning is we are talking about impacting people's homes uh, right where they live. And what we find in zoning is, is often sometimes uh, the, the argument over what might seem like a small detail, 0.3 meters in some cases, 
uh, can mean the world uh, to people. Uh, and that's something that we have deep respect for, that we have deep empathy for. And uh, we fully intend to do, make every effort to, to do as much as we can to reach out and have those discussions with people. Um, that is though needing to be bound by our commitment and, and requirement to implement what was just passed yesterday, which is the official plan and also achieve the growth management strategy, which means that we are going to have to come into those neighborhoods with a clear plan, but we're also going to have to come into those neighborhoods with a clear understanding of what is up for discussion and what is not up for discussion. And at the same time, be willing to work with those communities to discuss how we are going to make those numbers work within their neighborhoods. So uh, believe me, I, I'm well aware of um, what it is that we're facing. Uh, it is a daunting challenge, no doubt, uh, but we will work our way through this step by step. Uh, it is a big, big, big project that we're about to undertake, a, uh, a project that very few cities around the world uh, have had the courage to really go through and undertake. So we are, uh, we are certainly looking forward to, uh, to moving into the next step, which is to lay out what that detailed step-by-step -step plan is going to be in order to make this happen. All right, thank you very much. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Menard. Whoops, press the video button instead of my sound button. Thanks, Chair. Um, thank you for the report. Uh, looks good to me. Um, I think I'll echo comments of Councillor Leeper and Councillor Brockington around our community associations really wanting to dig in on this. And, and I mean that, I, I mean, I have seven community associations in, in my ward. Um, and um, they're very much interested in workshopping. Um, they don't want to see a high level presentation to them. They really want to get in a room or Zoom and, and workshop back and forth and test assumptions. So uh, that's going to be really important for this exercise uh, because their knowledge level is extremely high. They know their communities uh, best and they really want to work with, with staff directly. And I think we've found through the official plan process, there, there is an ability uh, to get things through that may not be what everybody wants, but we'll we'll find that, that middle ground. And uh, in this case, that's going to be really, really important. So um, uh, just to emphasize, the, the goal is not so much those broad high-level presentations in consultations, uh, but actual workshopping and meeting on a regular basis, I think with FCA community associations and the broader community uh, to talk about what uh, they want and to see that reflected in the plan as much as possible. Uh, I had a couple of questions um, as well. One is around the inclusionary zoning bylaw. So we had talked a lot about the need to approve the official plan as early as possible so that this could come fairly soon after. I, I'm wondering about an update on the timing of that. Is that set to come with the rest of the zoning bylaw update? My understanding is a lot more work has been done on that in advance and that there could be some pieces ready. And I say that reading the report, seeing that there might be a, a quick hits piece and a big moves piece that comes. So I just, I just would like to know where that portion fits and how we're going to be undertaking the work over the next couple of years. Yeah, inclusionary zoning is not going to wait until the three-year process for the zoning bylaw. We'll be bringing inclusionary zoning forward very, very soon. Uh, we've had a consultant working on the housing market analysis, which is required by provincial regulations. That housing market analysis is nearly complete. Uh, we are also looking at what Toronto is currently doing. Uh, they're the first uh, municipality to take the step uh, to move forward in inclusionary zoning. So we're um, communicating very closely with their staff. Uh, to see how that is rolling out. Uh, certainly watching very closely the reactions with industry, the discussions with stakeholder groups on those things as we go along. And we're certainly watching and seeing what they do uh, and seeing how things are going. Um, we expect that we will be looking forward to, uh, to moving with the housing market analysis and making that public uh, in, the, uh, in the next couple of months uh, and uh, engaging in a public consultation process uh, and discussions on how that's going to occur in an Ottawa context again over the next few months as well too. So we may be in a position to be able to bring forward inclusionary zoning, including an official plan amendment uh, and zoning bylaw updates uh, in the next year. Uh, and that is certainly something that we would like to do. We, uh, we certainly recognize that this is a, uh, a piece of uh, the housing continuum package that we would like to address. 
Uh, but we also recognize as well that that is something that uh, has an awful lot of moving parts to it and an awful lot of sensitivities to it as well. But it's not going to wait three years. Thanks, uh, Mr. Wise. That's very helpful. Um, with regard to development charges, again, a separate conversation, but there's some implication here. My understanding is the DC full update, which we really badly need in this city, uh, would not be taking place until next term of council. I think 2024 is the schedule for that. Um, that's a separate piece. Is that, is that any way related to this? Uh, will it come at the same time or do you have any other information for us on how that'll work? I don't know if Don has uh, more information with respect to the, uh, the BC bylaw schedule for the update, but certainly with respect to relationships between the zoning, between the land use, between development charges, between cash and build parkland, uh, between all of those pieces, there is significant interrelationship between all of those documents. Um, so we all do need to be working together, uh, just as a simple uh, uh, codex here. Uh, a lot of definitions are shared back and forth. For example, what is a multi-unit building? What is an apartment building? Uh, and how do those uh, DC rate calculations um, roll out from there? So there is an awful lot of interplay. Uh, Don, I don't know if you wanted to speak to the schedule. Yeah, thank you, uh, Chair. I think the Councillor is correct in terms of the timing of the, the new DC bylaw. Uh, my understanding is that does not affect this ask for the, uh, uh, the funding for the, uh, the zoning bylaw. So. I can confirm the uh, specific dates, but I believe it is. Okay, thank you for that. And this la one last comment is, is we're going to be undertaking this exercise. It's going to be a lot of work for city staff, a lot of work for our communities and for council. And I hope uh, there's been a lot of promises made through the OP process around this, around tree preservation, our green space, et cetera. A lot of that has been referred to this process. <clears throat> and so... Um, another plea, I think, to for us to defend this when it is done, um, that we, we, we hold it up and say, this is brand new. Let's defend what we're putting forward as much as possible. Um, yeah, applications are allowed to come in, of course, but this will be really important to, um, to uh, get behind and, uh, and stick to what we say uh, when we do it. So thank you again, Mr. Wise, uh, Mr. Herwire, and uh, back to you, Chair. Okay, thanks, Councillor. I'm seeing no more questions from the committee. Uh, thank you, David, for the uh, information this morning. Are the report recommendations carried? Carried. 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 Thank you. And just to note, uh, this report is also going to be considered by ARAC on November 4th next week. Um, item number two was the zoning bylaw amendment for 2865 Riverside Drive in Riverward. We have, um, we have a speaker, Steve Farrago, who's here. Steve, are you with us this morning? He's coming online now, Chair. Thank you. And we also have uh, the applicant who's available as well. Chair, I take it there's no presentation by staff if we're going to delegations right away. We're, well, we could have a presentation, but uh, I think we'll, we'll proceed right to our delegations this morning. Sorry, uh, I guess uh, apologies. Steve Fargo is here. Hi, Steve. Good morning. Uh, so you have uh, five minutes and the floor is yours. Okay. I don't have a formal presentation. Uh, forgive me. Uh, this is my first time in this type of forum and I'm not aware of uh, the actual protocols. So uh, since I have five minutes, so allow me to provide maybe some background uh, and then I'll, I'll ask my questions, if that's okay. Um, so with regards to, the, to this zoning to the 2865, uh, which is the St. Patrick's home, there's, a, there's some history there, uh, which I like to, uh, to highlight. Um, so this, there's, there's a new building that was built for St. Patrick's home back in around the 2011, 2013 timeframe. And where I live in the condo area on 2909 Riverside Drive, and I'm guessing as well for the uh, Egan Road and uh, Gardner Avenue uh, adjacent uh, homes, um, uh, was a nightmare for us, basically. Uh, construction, you know, um, was obviously daily, uh, and I'm talking daily seven days a week for uh, unless that holidays occurred, which were probably, that was the break. But what the, was the concern in addition to the daily noise, because uh, I work from home, 
uh, even today, obviously what most of you now do because of COVID. But nevertheless, back then I worked from home as well, mostly. And so that was bad enough during the day, but the fact that they went before the allowable times of 7 a.m. and after the 2200 time frame, or even on weekends of 9 to 20, uh, I can't remember what the uh, actually the uh, the stop time now is on weekends, but I think it's uh, 9 a.m. on the, to start, but I can't remember the end time. But anyhow, they went beyond those allowable times. I, I complained to the city of Ottawa a couple of times to no avail. I even went actually to talk to the foreman and ask him if uh, you know if he could respect the hours. That worked for maybe a couple of days, but there, that sort of uh, subsided very quickly. Um, further to that, uh, what what that caused, uh, other than the, uh, than the noise, obviously, that there was also the the construction, which creates a lot of uh, I'll call it for lack of a better term, some type, uh, some sort of sand type dust, which was left in my backyard, all my neighbors' backyards. Uh, the patio, you know, the patio door windows, the bedroom windows, and the constant cleaning was intensively labor, uh, laborish, basically, and had to be done often. And if you think about that, that was for at least, you know, for uh, a year, if not more, solid, that that's had to be done on a regular basis. So obviously, winter time didn't affect, but then the summertime was painful, to say the least. So, and I'll just make a quick comment um, that, uh, you know, uh, think about where you're living right now. Uh, sorry, just before I say that, uh, and then, you know, a five-story building went behind our backyards, basically, right? So think about where you live. If you live in a single home right now, and suddenly a five-story uh, building gets erected behind your backyard, there's no more privacy. Uh, it's co completely gone, right? Um, so further to that as well, the um, with the fight with this the new building that was created uh, in 2013, this has created an amplified sound from Riverside Drive traffic. Before, I never heard any noise. Now, I hear it uh, constantly, uh, the street traffic, or even as far as, um, um, I can't remember the park's name now, uh, Confederation Heights, as far as that. It's an unbelievable, actually. Not to mention, uh, you know, loss of sunlight as well. So all this to say, uh, you know, with, with the additional construction at, uh, or the rezoning the St. Patrick's, uh, or sorry, at 28 to 65 is looking to do, my fear is all this will be uh, another nightmare uh, that will reoccur as to where I live. Notwithstanding as well, I know this is not on the topic at hand, but 70, uh, 729 Ridgewood Avenue is also, uh, there's a, also a zoning bylaw that is, uh, is planning to be done. I'm not sure actually where that sits right now, uh, but I know that's uh, forthcoming as well. So if you, if you know, that's this part of Ottawa. That means on both my left and right side, uh, that there's going to be some construction happening, basically. One minute left. So all this to say, so if if there's basically, if, if this, I'm not sure, if the, hopefully this is recorded, what I'm saying uh, into the minutes, but I'm not sure how, so for the, you know, the uh, the uh, working uh, time bylaw, if it's how that's going to be respected. If there's going to be any mess that I will incur or the, or the private citizens will incur, or the residential, I should say, that will incur, what will the city of Ottawa or the construction company do uh, to help us out here instead of us taking care of the, uh, uh, or, or left to do this labor work of cleaning our homes constantly, basically. Okay, thank you very much, Steve. Um, we have a question for you from Councillor Brockington. Thanks, Chair. Just with some uh, some leniency, I, I just don't want to make a statement to Mr. Farrago. Mr. Farrago, I'm, I'm your city councillor. It's Riley Brockington speaking. Um, I took over after the current St. Pat's home building was built, but I just want to share with you my strategy for construction projects. I like to host not just an information meeting before it comes to this committee, but before they actually start construction, I host a construction mitigation meeting with the contractor and local residents and the property owner. And we go through the construction timelines and we talk about mitigation efforts to ensure that the impact on neighboring residences and businesses is mitigated. It won't, it's not never perfect, but we go through those concerns. That's my commitment to you. If we need to talk offline about other uh, issues that you're concerned about, I'll give you all the time that, that you need, but that's my um, uh, 
strategy is before shovels go in the ground, I will offer to meet with residents and have these discussions. So we have an itemized list of what those concerns are, how we can mitigate them so that we can coexist as best we can during construction. So that's my commitment. Well, thank you, Mr. Brogdon for that. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure how that's, how am I gonna be invited to that? I guess you could say, or when is that gonna take place? Is there a sort of a planned meeting uh, that's forthcoming? Once uh, I know the timeline's better for construction, I will just like I did in the summer, hand deliver an invite to abutting neighbors, including uh, your condo on Riverside and we'll go from there. Okay. So you can always follow up with me by email if, if you haven't, don't hear from me soon. Um, I don't think shovels are going in the ground tomorrow, but it will probably be in the spring. So we will connect soon. So my last question, thank you for that. My last question is how, how did this get approved to begin with? And if it's too long of an answer, then we can talk offline. Uh, but again, you know, just to my earlier comment about, I find it uh, really odd that a five-story building would get built adjacent uh, between uh, residential homes, for, uh, commercial property. That to me, I'm baffled. Again, this could be a long answer and a, and a sort of a, um, uh, other discussion that needs to happen, but I find it really, uh, I know this is completely different. So I, you know, I apologize to me. I don't mean necessarily need to go there in the sense that this is a different topic because it's gonna be, uh, I believe facing Riverside, uh, but still. You know, I, I find it uh, difficult sometimes to understand how zoning get, gets approved. Um, and maybe it's just my lack of knowledge, that's all. Jerry, I don't know if you want me to answer or with it. Well, I was, I was gonna suggest perhaps that that is a question that's best taken offline. Uh, uh, Councillor Brockington may be able to discuss that with you and even uh, bring into the conversation some of the city planners and look at some of the historical uh, discussions and decisions for, for this area. So I think that that would likely be the best route to take, Steve. Okay. Thank you very much for your, uh, your presentation and sharing your comments today. Thank you for I'm your time. No more. No more questions. So uh, we do have several representatives from the applicant who are available to, to speak and answer questions. We have James Ireland from Novatech, Anna Froelich from CCOC, and Cheryl Humuth and Janet Morris from St. Patrick's Home. Um, for the applicant, did you wish to make a, a, to provide comments in the committee today? Or I'm not sure if there's any questions from committee members in particular. <laughs> Morning, James. Morning, Jeff. Uh, we don't have anything further to add, um, except to say that this is the zoning amendment application and, and obviously the site plan will follow. So we haven't made an application for site plan. So a lot of issues will be dealt with through that process. And obviously that will delay uh, construction, I would expect past the spring at the very least. But if there is, any other questions for me, I'm happy to answer. Otherwise, I believe we're, we're okay. Thanks. Okay, thank you. So I'll look to the committee. Any questions for the applicant? I'm seeing none. So thank you to, to James and your team for being here today, but I'm seeing no questions. Um, just for clarity, uh, on the report recommendations, let's do yays and nays, just so it's clear to people who are tuning in today. Chair, can I just make a few comments? Oh, absolutely. Yes, Councillor Brockton. So Chair, I will be supporting this application. I'm proud to see the application on behalf of the Catholic Congregational Legacy Charity for phase two of their development. The um, original St. Pat's home, which was built on the location we're actually talking about now came down in 2012-2013. Um, the current building that is open now was opened in 2014 and it's a beautiful building. It's a long-term care home and phase two, the proposal before us today is not a long-term care home per se. It's more of an apartment style building that will provide congregate living opportunities. There will be affordable housing units in this building. And um, I think for the members of the community who came out to the public meeting in July, that was an attractive feature for them. They really like to see that this is um, 
there are components within the building where people can, can dine together and, and be together. So that there are private living quarters, but there's also common areas within the building for people to, to congregate and be together. And um, the fact that the building's not being built on the abutting property line with the residential, it's actually in the middle of the property with very generous setbacks on the very north end of this property. Uh, the exact opposite side from uh, the, the delegation we just heard, I think are all positive. So uh, concerns that were raised are site plan related. And I certainly work with the applicant and the community when we get to the site plan. But as far as the planning application, I think this is a very good fit for our community where we want to see a diverse mixed dwelling types in Riverside Park, Mooney's Bay. And I think that this will be a good fit. So I'm supportive of the application. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor. Uh, worth noting too, given all of our discussions recently around tree and tree canopy, is I believe no trees are being proposed for removal as part of the construction as well. And there's a significant number of trees on the, in the general site there. Okay, let's do uh, yays and nays on this app. Oh, Chair, can we just carry, uh, right can we just carry it with, uh, if there's any dissents? I don't know why we have to do yays and nays. I agree. I suppose we could, yeah, we're just, uh, Traditionally, I've done some yeas and nays when we've we've had delegations for clarity. But um, if the committee would like to do <laughs> to carry it, then we can do that. Carried. Carried. The report recommendations are carried. Okay, thank you. Okay, we're going to move on to the third item, which is the zoning bylaw amendment for one twenty nine and one thirty three Catherine Street and Somerset Ward. We have the motion that's been introduced by Kath, uh, Councillor McKenney. And I know there were some questions, uh, uh, questions on the motion, um, Councillor Dudas. Perfect, thank you very much. I just, uh, the wording in the um, deferral motion speaks to needing proof. Um, and I just was wondering if maybe staff can clarify what kind of proof would we be seeking in terms of um, ensuring that this applicant is, is meeting our needs before we allow it to go forward. Um, thank you, Councillor, for the question. Um, to staff's to staff's thoughts on the motion. To be fair, we did not know that this motion was coming. Um, typically, in in assessing an application today for one twenty nine Catherine Street, it's it's very abnormal to tie it to conditions for or a situation for another site that the the applicant happens to own. So. I believe it's staff's position that we would not support the motion and that we're here today to deal with the zoning amendment request for 129 Catherine Street. And I did want to speak to one comment from the councillor in our opening submission on construction at this site uh, at Catherine Street. Construction actually has started on this site. Um, the project was um, is already formed and built and, and wrapped in Tyvek, as you can see in my presentation. But um, we should be focusing on this application at hand. I appreciate the councillor's concerns on the, the long, long history and frustrating history at Somerset House, but um, it's our position that we should be focusing on the matter at hand. And I, and I don't know how to give you that answer, councillor, on what that proof would be um, with respect to Somerset House being advanced far enough. Thank you. Okay, so, and, and I, I appreciate that. I appreciate your expertise on it. I think that you know, the, the history of uh, Somerset House and the adjacent properties, although it was mentioned in this motion, has been widely reported on. Um, I recall being a reporter and having covered this very story. And we know of the neglect and the damage that it caused to something that could have been a wonderful heritage building. Um, so I don't like rewarding bad behavior uh, in respect to property owners that have preside over a heritage structure or anything else for that matter, especially when they're flouting uh, city rules and regulations in other respects. So while I respect, Simon, your comments about how we should look at this one application, I think in, uh, in the greater, greater good, it does tie in to past history and precedent in terms of this property owner. I, I will be supporting deferral. I do would like, I would like to know though what the proof would be. And maybe if I could put the question to the mover, whether it's this time, I'd like to know what would be kind of that test as to whether we can proceed or not. 
Yeah, Thank you. Uh, yeah, with your will, uh, co-chair, if I will. And I, I want to just say that I didn't not send it to staff. Uh, I, I did that intentionally because this is this this is not um, in the purview of development review in terms of a deferral. So uh, this, um, yeah, I, I I did not um, include staff for for that very reason. Um, and you know when we when we think about the you know when we think about the 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 proof, if you will, that we're going to get movement on on Somerset House, um, it, it's it's a commitment to actually deliver on on the plans that uh, that they've brought to staff, they've worked with staff, they've they've you know the much much uh, staff time has been taken up on. You know, possible applications going forward. Uh, so for me, it would be an application in front of us that is serious uh, and that uh, that they are committed to following through on. And until we see that, um, you know, this is this will drag on, I believe, uh, for years um, before we uh, before we see any movement. We just really don't have any other way of, of pushing it forward. So it's to send them back essentially, to say, you know what, you come in front of us with an application that is serious, that, that you're committed to on Somerset House, and you get that approved. And when you get that approved, you come back on Catherine Street. Thank you, Catherine. Councillor McKay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Cloutier. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you. And um, I'll, I'll certainly support a deferral, absolutely, and and I could certainly see um, if the um, it, the it would be a no-brainer if it would be an application on the property that is not in compliance, absolutely, um, and I, I empathize because, as you said, uh, Councillor McKenney, we have so few tools, and we saw that in in Councillor Menard's ward with West Coast Video, and we have. In my in my ward at 2660 South Vale Crescent, uh, problematic uh, property owners, and so I understand that, and I, I see your opportunity here to send a strong message to the property owner that uh, you have an application on this property, but we still have concerns. Um, I guess the <clears throat> can I ask staff what is the statutory deadline for a decision by planning committee on this application? If, if I may, uh, Mr. Chair, the, the, the statutory timeline is long past. It's It was months ago. So we're into a position where it could be appealed by the owner. There, thank you for that. And so we can get appealed. Um, and what are the, there are monetary implications. We will have to defend that appeal. Um, any other legal implications with respect to, with respect to, to, um, to that action? Mr. Chair, as Mr. Diaco uh, outlined to committee, it is normal practice for an application in respect of a parcel of land to be evaluated solely on the land use impacts related to that parcel of land. To move beyond that will put the city in a difficult position for the Ontario Land Tribunal. Noted. What is a difficult position, Mr. Mark? Can you elaborate? <laughs> Reputational, financial, um, uh, um, both, Mr. Chair. Both, Mr. Chair. Okay. Can you speak to? Uh, I see on the report it's it's public information. TKS Holdings. What if the two parcels were not in the same um, uh, uh, name? Would that weaken our position? Mr. Chair, in, in my opinion, it makes no difference. So if they makes no use re, um, different numbered companies to own it, or if it's owned by the same company, that does not change the city's, whatever position the city has in this. Okay, thank you for that. And my last question, I guess, is to, is to Councillor McKinney and, and it's, um, 
it amplifies what uh, Councillor Dudas said, and maybe we can take it offline. You know, what is a serious proposal? What is the proof that the property owner can be responsible? It's, uh, I, I would just, I want to be supportive. Absolutely, because again, we have so few tools, but, I, uh, and, and perhaps we could have that, that conversation, uh, Councillor McKinney, as to what your expectations are, because I certainly, <clears throat> Somerset House is, certainly an important uh, parcel of land at Bank in Somerset, and we do want to see it improved and, uh, and that property used. So I, if we could uh, connect on that, yeah. I would appreciate it. Chairs, thank you. Merci. Councillor Menard. Thanks very much, uh, Chair. Um, it's important, I think, that, that we start to get a little more tough with uh, property owners who keep decrepit buildings like this in our in our city, and it's not just that; it's the ones that flout the rules on a regular basis through property standards and otherwise. We have so many uh, cases of that. I have several in my ward where um, a developer comes in, puts something up that uh, wasn't agreed to, whether through committee of adjustment or the uh, the site plan. They uh, ask for, or they just simply put in extra bedrooms, for example. We've got property owners that keep decrepit buildings uh, on our main streets for a very, very long time. Uh, one thing we did when we first came in in, in 2018, 2019, is we worked with city staff on the um, bylaw review. And we really pushed hard to get vacant buildings uh, bylaw review in there and we got that in there and staff are supposed to come back in early 2022 is my understanding um with uh, some updates and i'm hoping more teeth compared to what we have in some other cities in ontario and, and across the country for vacant buildings um, obviously west coast video is an example and we're making progress on that now but uh sat like that for for 12 years somerset house is a heritage building um we need to be looking at expropriation for that building. We need to be pushing for expropriation of, of that building. And we have, we do have the option to expropriate, but as Councillor McKenney says, it is it is not easy. Uh, but th this, this committee, I think, should be sending a message. And uh, I understand uh, some of the implications um, with individual applications. But if we just keep going on this route, we're going to continue to see our, our rep rules flouted. So, you know, I support the motion and I also support full and complete expropriation of, of Somerset House as a heritage um, building as soon as possible. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor. I, I wanted to ask Mr. Mark, can you just elaborate a bit more on the resources you would need to defend this at LPAT, like in terms of cost or is it external counsel? Is it internal staff would be defending that? Um. <laughs> Mr. Chair, uh, we would need an external planner. Uh, that much is for certain. Um, as to the legal counsel that would do it, as I sit here, I, I don't know what the legal case would be. And sending it outside or doing it inside, it's the same problem. So I say for, sh for sure we would need an external planner. Uh, I, would expect, um, I would expect the applicant uh, to bring a motion uh, uh, to the tribunal in order to seek to deal with this in an expedited format based on the situation as I understand it at this time. Okay, thank you, Mr. Mark. Um, Councillor Brockington. I think uh, Councillor Moffat had his hand up there. Oh, so he does. Um, your hand is hidden in the frame of your picture on That's my true. screen, Councillor Chair Moffat. Uh, go ahead, Scott. Thanks, I'll have to change the color of my hand, make it one of these more Simpsons hands, because apparently it's too white. Um, I, you know, I think I understand the, the reality of this and, and, and we heard from Tim Mark, you know, we know that if this owner goes and appeals this decision, that, you know, we might lose. Um, Councillor Menard talked about expropriation of the property. Uh, this owner, doesn't deserve a cent of city money. If we expropriated this property, we'd have to pay market value for it. He wins. I, that, that is not okay with me. 
Deferring it might cost us a bit of money. But at this point, I'd rather spend money tying this guy up in court than giving him money to walk away and giving him the full value. And then we own the property. And then it's our problem. And then we have to try to repair the building or sell the building or get it developed. All of a sudden, the liability is on us. And he's walking away with all the money. Got issues with that. This is someone who does not play by the rules. So why should we be expected to as well? There's a long history on this. Simon mentioned that uh, there's Tyvek rap on it. The Tyvek rap went up in April of 2019, or at least before April of 2019. And before that, there was other Tyvek rap on the building. This is a this is a property that partially collapsed. They framed the they held the the brick wall up, but didn't do any insulation on the brick wall. Guess what happens when brick is exposed on both sides? It crumbles. So it fell down and we had to take down the rest of the wall. If you don't maintain the property in any shape or form, it will further break apart. This is demolition by neglect. And, you know, maybe we shouldn't. Maybe it's wrong to tie this property to the other. But this person does nothing for us. They never have. I've sat on built heritage subcommittee since we created the committee in 2012. This keeps on coming back. New drawings. He had Richard Schmiel, great architect, Richard Schmiel. In my opinion, Tony K wasted Richard Schmiel's time. Because Richard Schmiel brought forward a great project for this property in 2013. And then more submitted drawings in 2017, but still nothing. Oh, but tie back wrap. So I'm fine with deferral on this. If it means that TKS holdings end up at the OLT on Catherine Street, so be it. But you can't let people like this keep on running roughshod over our rules, our elected officials. I mean, how many times have we talked about this, Councillor McKenney, Mayor Watson, about this property? And even before them, this predates almost our entire council membership, this issue. Uh, so whatever we can do, uh, to hold this guy to some sort of account that we have such limited ability to do, then we should take that opportunity. Councilor Brockington. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, uh, Councilor Moffat, for those comments. I um, just wanna know from Mr. Mark, if this motion of deferral passes, What's the city's strategy? We, we reach out to the applicant and say, the committee's put this on the side burner. We want you to address issues. Do you come back to this committee to give us an update? Is this a binding deferral that we don't wanna hear until they've actually made some concrete progress? Talk me through this. Mr. Mr. Chair, um, Based on the wording of the resolution, uh, a letter would go to the um, to the applicant uh, outlining uh, the position that council has taken uh, and a way to response from the applicant. Uh, the resolution is clear uh, in in that it seeks actions with respect to Somerset Street House. Um, I don't. Not immediately clear to me that absent action on Somerset House, uh, that the resolution invites staff uh, to come back to committee. Uh, and so um, I think that if it's appealed and a hearing is scheduled in front of the tribunal, there might be an opportunity uh, to report to committee at that time. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at if they don't appeal right away and they actually try and make some progress on some of the issues that Councillor McKinney has identified in their motion, when do we conclude, well, that's, that's sufficient. We now want to bring this back to committee. Like, I, I don't, ideally, I don't want to go to appeal. Ideally, I want the, the owner to address the issues that Councillor McKenney's concerned about, that we're all concerned about. But at what point 
do we conclude, all right, they've made sufficient progress. We're now gonna revisit their application for Catherine Street and we're gonna deal with that application outside of an appeal. Because I think we should avoid the appeal at all costs. We should actually try and make progress on the outstanding matters. Uh, Mr. Chair, it seems to me that this goes back to the first question uh, when this item came up uh, as to what, what, what is sufficient progress uh, to satisfy the motion? Uh, and I'm not in a position where I could answer that at this time. Okay, so I think that has to, you know, Councillor McKenna, you've heard that. I, I think that um, a landowner goes to appeal and his appeal is successful, nothing that's outstanding gets addressed because the appeal will only deal with the application. Right, and nothing, none of the outstanding matters will be germane to the appeal. The appeal is about Catherine Street application. And so I agree with our limited tool chest. This is one thing that Catherine McKenney is proposing to try and force them to address some of those outstanding issues. Like other colleagues, I'm, I'm willing to go down that route at this point. Um, but at the end of the day, I want to avoid appeal because I don't think appeals in the city's best interest. The, the appeal will just be about Catherine Street, and not, not the other matters. So thank you. Councillor Leeper. Thanks, uh, Chair. So colleagues, I, I don't know the legalities of this, um, but what I do know is that if we give this developer permission today uh, through a zoning for a new project from which they will profit, uh, that will only diminish trust. I'm no stranger to recalcitrant heritage property owners. I know how difficult it is to do my job as a city councillor when I'm forced to throw up my hands and plead process. Uh, I know the degree to which uh, residents uh, find that frustrating. They feel as if the city doesn't have their back. And um, dealing with the matter of Catherine Street today uh, is, is just going to make it that much more difficult for us to uh, win the trust of our, our residents that we've got their back. Uh, and I'm, I'm more than happy, uh, regardless of what the, the legal outcome might be, uh, to support Catherine in, uh, in this motion today. Okay, are there any other questions or comments on the deferral motion? Just Google McGee House if you want to know what uh, Councillor Leeper was just talking about. Don't even say it out loud. It's too soon. Councillor McKenney, did you want to wrap up on your deferral motion? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yeah, just very quickly. Um, I just want to... Um, thank everyone for their, their comments today uh, and for, you know, just uh, you're thinking around Somerset House. I mean, it, it really is. It's a part four heritage building. It is a prime example of demolition by neglect. I do believe at this point that is the, the goal of, uh, of the owner. And we just cannot allow that to happen in, uh, in our city. Um, you know, this is in front of us as a, a bylaw, is only bylaw amendment. Uh, we have the right to say yes or no. Um, this is, you know, and, and, and this is not conventional to, to defer something based on, on another property. But as several of you have pointed out, this is uh, an exceptional uh, case. This is an owner who has shown time and time and time again, year after year, uh, that uh, he is not willing to um, essentially be a good neighbor. And I say that when I respond to residents or when I walk down bank near Somerset, down Somerset near bank or the other way, I get stopped almost every time. I actually sometimes avoid that corner um, when, I'm, when I'm out walking because people do not understand, as Councillor Leeper said, they do not understand that we just don't have the tools to compel outside of expropriation, we don't have the tools to compel a developer, uh, you know, without a, a an empty buildings bylaw to actually do something with their with their property. Um, so it 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 is uh, it is not conventional. I understand that. Uh, what is proof? 
you know what, that's that that will be a political decision at some point if we get an application in front of us, if it's serious, if he's moving forward on site plan, perhaps that's the time. And that will be for, for us to, to decide again if, in fact, um, you know, it's not a, an LPAT or um, tribunal decision. But this is nothing more than sending a very strong message to not just this owner, but other owners in our city who are allowing buildings to be demolished by neglect, especially heritage buildings that we're not gonna stand for it anymore and that we're gonna use every tool we have as a committee, as a council uh, to ensure that we're holding, um, holding them to, to account uh, for uh, their responsibilities uh, in our city. So I thank everyone for the uh, thoughtful discussion and, uh, and uh, appreciate uh, your support. Thank you, thank you, Chair. Thanks, Councillor. I support you on this. And I actually think your motion does define when it's appropriate to consider this Catherine Street file again. You, you mentioned in the motion uh, the property owner being a responsible downtown property owner and committing to deliverable plans to really rehabilitate Somerset House. So you've got two conditions there. It's around plans to rehabilitate Somerset House. And uh, in the, the preamble to your, your motion, uh, you mentioned the non-conforming parking lot. So I think you're, you're very clear in the conditions that you want to see to establish responsible, a responsible owner and uh, a commitment to rehabilitate the building. So I thank you for introducing the, the deferral motion. Um, on that deferral motion, is it carried? Carried. 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 Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Um, there are no in-camera items today. Are there any notices of motion for consideration at a subsequent meeting? I'm seeing none. Are there any inquiries? Other business? All right, then we are adjourned and our next meeting is Monday, November 8th, a special Monday meeting because November 11th is Remembrance Day. So we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Thanks everyone. Great job keeping it under eight hours. Terrific. <laughs> have a good day, everyone. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. My only failure as chair is I, I, I spend too long.